Uh, w- welcome everybody to uh, Bench Talk 101. Tonight is a, is a great night. Um, we've got Richard Arnold that's going to talk us through strike planes um, and, and, and go through what's going on. Now, just a quick thing about what we're doing here. So there's quite, quite a few new people here tonight. Um, this is all about getting to know each other, getting to talk woodwork um, at your bench, um, being able to um, sort of learn about skills, tips, um, learn knowledge from, from other people. And, and really, this has all come about because of, because of COVID. Um, and we were all sort of, you know, in our own homes. Um, and we were kind of getting withdrawal symptoms of talking to each other and, you know, just, just talking through, you know, uh, problems that you had and, and things like that. So this idea here is that uh, woodworkers can get together, um, talk about different things. We can have a, a free talk later where you can pick up a tool and say, what about this? What about that? Um, and, and go from there. But the, the focus today really is, uh, is, is Richard Arnold. Um, now, a, a lot of you know Richard Arnold already. Um, he's an absolute, uh, uh, has a wealth of knowledge of, of, uh, of, of, of hand planes, um, and in particular, 18th century hand planes. And today he's going to talk us through about a strike plane, and he's going to sort of talk about the techniques, talk about the skills. Um, and this particular one is one that he's actually made himself, and he's putting it into a, a, a prize drawer um, that you can, can hear about more. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass you over to, uh, to Richard. In- just to explain... I'm Richard Arnold, as Jeff was saying. Um, just a quick introduction for those who don't know me. Um, I'm a working joiner and cabinet maker who's dabbled in woodwork since the age of 16, where I did an apprenticeship as a joiner. Uh, and I've always been interested in woodwork. And like Jeffrey was saying, one of my main interests is uh, 18th century woodworking tools, particularly planes and how they evolved and how they came about and how they evolved over the 18th century. And I spent a lot of time researching them and working out how they were used. Um, and with 18th century planes, a lot of the problem is that some of them just literally don't exist anymore. Um, and a while back, I, um, I started reading uh, The Art of Joinery by uh, Joseph Moxon. Uh, which was first published in 1678, so we're going back a long while. And in that book, he describes a plane that's called a strike block plane, which is probably not that familiar to a lot of people. Um, It's not really been in use for a long, long time. Um, And it actually disappeared out of use for quite a long period after the early 18th century and then sort of reappeared towards the end of the 19th century. So what is a strike block plane and what it was used, what was it used for? Well, I can't show you an 18th century example because I don't know of one in existence. And um, reading Moxton, um, I'll just uh, read out how he describes it. Um, The strike block is a plane shorter than the jointer, having its sole made exactly flat and straight, and is used for the shooting of short joint because it is more handy than the long jointer. It is also used for framing and fitting the joints of mitres and bevels you are to fit. You must hold it very steady in your left hand and with the sole of it upwards and its forend towards your right hand, you must hold your work in your right hand very steadily, then apply the sawn timber or sawn bevel at the end of your stuff, work or workpiece, to the fore end of the strike block and so thrust it hard and upright against until it passes over the edge of the iron. What he's describing there is actually to hold the plane, get that right, sort of upside down and you pass the workpiece over it. It's almost like using a a Cooper's jointer. Um, So it's quite, quite alien to how we normally sort of see planes. Now this is the plane that I made to try and find out what an 18th century strike block may have been like. Um, The way I came about on the design was that the 19th century ones seemed to be about 12 inches long, which is what I made this. Um, They also seem to be quite low pitched. Um, So this is pitched at 40 degrees. Uh, The wedge style um, is sort of something that I make most of my bench planes looking like. This was um, sort of copied from one of the only 
examples of an early 18th century plane we've got from that period. This is a Robert Woodin panel plane, and you can see the sort of stepped and rounded wedge here. Um, and this is what I base all my uh, bench planes on. Um, why were they shaped like this? Um, it's been sort of suggested that it's perhaps uh, um, brought in from the Dutch tradition. That could well be. Um, I think uh, a lot of the shaping is perhaps originally, I think they probably had a more decorative tool back there and it's a bit more labour intensive, but they seem to think it was worth the while putting that extra work into it. But if you look at the, um, let's put the other plane up, it's easier to see on that. Um, not only is it stepped that way, it's stepped in at the sides a little bit. Now, I think, although that is a decorative feature, I think there was a practical reason for that as well. Um, when you are laterally adjusting your iron, uh, tapping it from either side with a, with, a, with a hammer, on a conventional wooden plane, the wedge is parallel and the same thickness as the iron, and it is quite easy if you're not careful to hit the edge of the wedge uh, as well as the iron and that can actually split the cheeks out but by reducing the wedge in its width there's a lot less chance of doing that so I think there was a practical reason for that shape of wedge um, so the angle as I said is about 40 degrees and um, I think Jim uh, mentioned in a, a video he said when I originally made this plane um, I did a bit of a test on a shooting board with it to see how it compared to other planes that I got and see how well it worked and it, it actually almost outperformed every other plane I got on shooting end grain and I've been thinking about it since then um, it's a plane that's um, beveled down so it's, it's, it's not like a mitre plane where it's beveled up and when you think about it, it's pitched at 40 degrees and the actual working angle, the attack angle is 40 degrees because of that, because it's beveled down. And I thought that's actually lower than just about any other plane in a way, because even a, a block plane pitched at 12 degrees, uh, if you add the grinding angle at 30 degrees, you're already up to um, uh, Oh, uh, 42 degrees so that's actually a higher pitch than this so this actually is lower pitch than any other plane I have and that could be a reason why it's working so well on end grain um, I have to apologize to Jeffrey he was gonna ask me to um, actually demonstrate at the bench but I haven't been back to the workshop today I've had a horrendous day on site and I didn't get a chance to get back to the workshop to get a, a shooting board or any timber so I'm afraid I can't actually demonstrate it um, on this plane the only other feature it's got is my stripe button uh, which is this lozenge shape that's my sort of trademark I was thinking about stripe buttons earlier when I thought I'd sort of mentioned that you've got a stripe button I can't actually remember ever seeing an 18th century plane with a strike button. It's just something that I choose to do. Um, and I think they are very practical on a wooden plane because it makes adjusting the blade a lot easier. Uh, and I find it better than striking the back of the plane itself. So that's what Moxon was describing and what they were used for. I think they were probably used on shooting boards for shooting end grain as well. Um, why they sort of faded out, I don't know, but it could have been that they were superseded. Well, I want to sort of talk about the um, where we went from the strike block and where they went on to. Sort of probably sometime in the middle of the 18th century, probably more in Europe than in England, um, a plane starts to appear, um, which we're all probably quite familiar with, which is what we call a mitre plane. Um, this is a Robert Tau. Um, this is a bit later. This is probably about 1820 or whatever. But pretty much it's the same sort of picture as, uh, I mean, a plane that would have been used towards the sort of latter end of the 18th century. Um, now, um, they're called mitre planes, and we always sort of associate them with maybe shooting mitres or shooting end grain. I have my doubts as to actually that that's what they were originally intended for. Jeffrey, I've, I've probably slipped up. 
could you put up the slide of the um, the oil painting, please? I, yes. I, did, I meant to put the Moxham one up, but I forgot to do it. Um, can we just put the Mox one up, actually, Jeffrey? And I'll, if you can see, I think it's B4. It, I, I can't actually see the whole screen. Uh, no, it's B3 is what he's describing as a, a strike block. As you can see, it's a very plain plain with no, no tote to it or anything like that. Um, I very much doubt that that's what an English uh, strike block looked like anyway, because I think he borrowed all these plates from a French text anyway. So all those planes on there look French to me anyway. Um, this is a picture of me actually using it in the workshop, as he was describing, by holding it upside down and then shooting the mitre over the top. Uh, that, that was, that's what Moxon was describing, the actual action of using it. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Jeffrey. Um, and this is where I think it's, it's, it's more practical, like using it on a shooting board in this day and age, that that makes it a lot easier to actually manipulate and hold. So if we can move to the next slide, this is what I was going to talk about with the mitre planes. Um, I've only recently discovered this oil painting. Um, I think this was done, I think it's about 1770, 1780. It's an English oil painting. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's showing the interior of a, an English workshop, but the two gentlemen in it are actually, I think they were, I can't remember whether it was Swedish or Finnish or something like that. Um, but most interesting about this is if you look on the bench just below the table they're working on, look at the plane, it's obviously an English mitre plane. Now, this painting is called The Marketeers. And they are marquetry workers. It was a marquetry workshop. Um, and I think the mitre plane came about because they needed a very, very fine mouth plane for truing up um, areas of marquetry and probably also for jointing um, the veneers they were using when they were doing book match veneers. Their veneers were a lot thicker than what we see today. So you could actually plane the edge of the veneers on the shooting board. And if you can think of a lot of the 18th century mahogany furniture, that curly, finely figured mahogany, you imagine trying to shoot the edge of that with an old wooden triplane or jack plane, it would have been tearing out lumps all over the place. And they needed something that would work really, really accurately. Uh, and I think that's where the mitre plane originated from. Um, so moving on from that, um, I will show you this little fellow here. Um, I recently found this. This is a strike block plane. Uh, it's by no recognisable maker. Um, and it's probably early 19th century, but it gives you an idea they were making planes like this. But to find early ones is extremely rare. Um, this is about the only really old one I know. Um, they did make an appearance towards the end of the 19th century back in the catalogues and they were made and sold. Um, this is an example by, I can't even remember its point now, um, bear with me, Moolish of London, if I'm pronouncing that right. I never know how to pronounce his name. This probably dates from about 1890, 1900. One of the interesting features of this one, it's the only one I've ever seen, it's actually a skewed strike block plane. Um, I think it was definitely intended for use on a, a, a shooting board. Going back to uh, the mitre plane, um, th this form went on and was made right up until probably the end of the 19th century. Uh, but towards the middle of the 19th century, people like um, Spears, um, started to make what they call an improved pattern mitre plane. This is a really fine example uh, that um, uh, I don't know any of you know Tim Smith. Tim Smith restored this for me. Um, so that's, that's a Spears improved pattern mitre plane. Um, interestingly enough, I, I think this is one of the most beautiful looking planes that was ever produced. Um, I'm going to be controversial now. I also think it's one of the most god awful things to use in in reality uh, to actually hold because it's not comfortable at all. I'd much sooner use the traditional one. 
uh, I find they're much more comfortable to hold and use. So although they're absolutely beautiful, um, I don't actually rate them as an actual working plane. Um, they were obviously very expensive to make, so uh, even in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century, um, they were making the wooden equivalent of the metal mitre plane, which is, this is an example by Griffiths of Norwich. Uh, and you see it's low angled again, um, but it's got this curious feature that some of you are probably aware of, is what they call a boxwood closer, um, which is a, an end grain boxwood um, plug that goes down and comes out at the mouth here. And you can actually knock that down and close the mouth up as the plane wears out. Um, so that's, that's, that's an English sort of wooden. That they're notoriously, they're notoriously uh, difficult to keep in good order. I think one of the problems was that um, they're very nearly always split at the mouth here at the sides because the beach shrank faster than the boxwood in my opinion um, and the, you, know, you normally get splits occurring down here so um, I have noticed on the 18th century examples that I've um, seen which are very few and far between they've had beach closers and they were probably cutting the same bit of beach out as the stock uh, and that probably helped alleviate that problem of the shrinkage. And when I've made these in the past, I've done the same. I've used the same block of beach from the same block of timber and used beach instead of the boxwood. It doesn't look so pretty, but I think it's more practical. Um, and um, they're still being made today. Uh, particularly by a gentleman in, uh, in Leicester. <laughs> um, this is one of my favourite mitre planes. This is one by Bill Carter. And uh, this plane I bought from Bill. Well, I, didn't, I sort of bought it from him. I swapped it for another full-size mitre plane. But at the time, I was working as a musical instrument repairer, um, working on violins and cellos. And uh, Bill always likes me to tell people this. This was the only plane I could find anywhere where I could actually true uh, an ebony fingerboard uh, without tearing any grain out whatsoever. And I, I don't use it so much these days, but when I was working as an instrument maker, this was in constant use day in, day out. And it is an absolutely superb plane. Um, Bill made, I think he made six of these at one point in all different metals. There was some steel ones, there was some brass ones, and this was the first ever gun metal one he made, or bronze. Um, and he brought them to me at the workshop, and uh, I said I'd like to swap this large scale mitre plane for a miniature one, because I needed a miniature one in the job I was doing. And he said, yes, I'll swap you one of them. And I said, which one do you want? And I said, oh, I'd I really like the bronze one. He says, oh, yes, yeah. but if you want that one, it'll be an extra 50 pounds. I don't think he really wanted to sell it at the time, but I was happy to give him the extra 50 pounds, and I've never regretted it. Um, this is another interesting mitre plane or low angle plane. I don't know whether any people are aware of this one. This was made by Oliver Sparks, um, very unusual pattern. It almost looks like a coffin smoother, but it's um, got this enclosed wedge here with a very low angle blade. Um, it's not Ollie's design as such. Um, there was an original one found on eBay uh, and Ollie copied it. So um, there are one or two of these out there, I think, of the original pattern. Um, and I, I think, um, that's probably as much as I was going to say on that. So I think we perhaps ought to go over uh, questions and answers and then let other people have a chat about whatever they want to chat, Jeffrey. All right. That's brilliant, uh, Richard. I mean, that's, that's great. You've shown us lots of different planes. You've talked us through the history of them. Um, let, let's have uh, any questions. Brennan, how, how long did that take you to make? <laughs> yeah, sorry. How long did it take to make? Um, I, I never really keep an eye on the amount of time I spend making a plane. I don't sort of sit down and say, I'm going to make a plane today and just work on that completely. Because I'm working as a full-time joiner and cabinet maker, I tend to um, 
just picking bit and do an hour here an hour there so i don't really know how long it actually took me um if i was to make another um i'd probably estimate about 20 hours but uh, maybe less i don't know my question my god i've got a build up it better be a good question um the uh Richard, the, the, it's a very unorthodox way you're describing that you held the planes sort of in the crook of your arm and took the workpiece across it. Yeah. Um, that kind of manoeuvre is something you tend to perform on site when you haven't got everything you need from the workshop. Is there any suggestion that maybe those planes were used in that way more on site for trimming architrave or some such um it, it, it seems such a cack-handed way of doing it or, or did you find did yeah. you find it work all right it, it's okay but um i totally agree because um i mean the other thing that moxon describes in his book is everybody makes these moxon vices um, so if he was in a workshop, I cannot understand why he wouldn't clamp the plane in a vice and then pass the wood over it. So yeah. I totally agree with you. Maybe he was describing um, uh, fitters on site, trimming architraves and what have you. Um, but even so, um, what I, I, I can see that working with maybe a small mould round a, um, a small panel where the pieces are short. But if you're trying to trim a six foot um, <laughs> uh, uh, architrave uh, leg, trying to do that upside down across the plane doesn't seem very practical. So, uh, I totally agree with you, Mike. Yeah, it does seem a little odd. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Anybody else want to comment? Or good, Rusty. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a more general question? So, when was it that the bevel up and bevel down planes kind of separated? It sounds to me like the earlier planes were the bevel down planes. And do you know what specifically they, they were? What's the delineation? Specific, what kind of jobs were they produced for? Uh, well, um, the only sort of. Um bevel up planes that I know of from the 18th century would be the mitre plane. Um, now, one of the advantages of a bevel up um, is that, particularly in the metal plane, is that the blade is supported by the bed nearly right up to the tip. So if you're trying to do a really fine work, say on marquetry, leveling a marquetry table, I think that could be an advantage. So you're going to probably get less chatter. So I think that's why they came about. But apart from mitre planes, the sort of bevel up plane didn't really come in until Stanley started producing block planes and low angled planes. So uh, apart from the mitre plane, that's the only sort of bevel up plane that I know of. I, I don't know whether anybody else wants to comment or can think of anything else that's uh, bevel up. Uh, chariot planes. Um, I've got. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a good point. Chariot planes. Um, I've never quite understood what chariot planes were brought in for, actually, Jim. Um, it's another one of them bugbears. I, I think they're really, really pretty planes, but I've owned a couple. And I've always got rid of them because I've found them a pretty, pretty useless, to be honest with you. I don't actually like them. The. Um, I don't mind so much the uh, uh, Irish pattern actually because it's got a longer uh, bed in front of the iron, but I'm not that keen on chariot planes. But um, yes, they, but again, uh, I suppose they were uh, mid to late 19th century. Uh, again, there's nothing in the 18th century other than the mitre plane. This is all English though. I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with continental. Um, uh, European planes. Whether they had anything, I don't know. I think we're all looking at you, Chester, over there. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, might be able to, you might be able to comment on on what it's like in the states uh, of, of what we're what we're talking about here. Well, well, I was just I pulled out because I knew of, about 
what the discussion was going to be about today, I pulled a few blocks that I have. Um, the Lee Nielsen uh, uh, piano maker's plane, which is uh, a, a very low angle, and uh, and and it's a bevel up plane. I don't know if you all can see that somewhere. There's a camera, um, and then the other one is this uh, 62 Stanley which also is a very, very low, I mean, an extremely low blade. Um, if you can see the top of this knob here, that's just under the blade. So it's, it's, it's almost horizontal. And again, bevel up. And I've had this discussion with people about uh, the, the bevel up versus down. And some people claim that there's no difference because the same point is held in. When you raise the angle of, of, a, of a blade, then you wind up with, um, uh, uh, I, I don't see how it's possible to do a low angle bevel down, because if the blade is close to horizontal, anything that you cut off on the bottom is aiming up, so it's not gonna go through the mouth of the plane. So I think that's the biggest distinction there, and, and the reason for the low angle in my mind, and in my experience, was that it creates more of a sheer cut and, and hence uh, uh, gets rid of a lot of tear out because you're cutting across those fibers rather than taking a plane like a chisel, a high chisel, and, scra and not scraping, you're still cutting, but it, it tends to give you more tear out. That's only through experience. There's no, I don't have anything to back it up. But I, I, I have some questions, but I'll let other people talk, and then I'll ask those other questions pertaining to what Richard was talking about with his plan. Good. Sorry, I'll just quickly apologize for the interruption a few moments ago. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we'll accept your apology for the second interruption. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do, do we have any other questions there? I, well, Jim's there clapping away. and, and uh, Yeah, how do you, I'm not sure how we, how we rate, do we, just speak and get notified to ask a question or yeah martin i mean i i can see i can see you all and and basically i'm just taking the cues from people like nodding or waving or stuff like that so okay. martin, i noticed there's a, there's a there, you could raise your hand in 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 zoom i, I did do that right. a minute ago yeah i, I wanted yeah. to uh, ask richard that i noticed in the, in the description of the in the book about using the the plane it said grab it in your left hand or right hand and use with the opposite hand i just wondered if, if being a left hander he did it opposite <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder why uh, i wonder if that was the reason he found it awkward <laughs> I, I i think with a stripe block it doesn't really make any difference to be honest with you, because i didn't follow him but uh, it's one of those few planes that is completely ambidextrous in that respect uh, okay. a lot of other planes i do have to think about but with a strike block there really isn't any uh apart from the skewed one that, that that's obviously the wrong way around for me but um yeah no that doesn't really make any great difference to me um but uh, yeah point taken though yeah <laughs> if i follow this letter to the law i didn't do that i just went on instinct <laughs> yeah. there, there, um, there actually is a modern example of this um recently in the last sort of 12 months um it's called a hovel um, and it's a tiny little plane and you hold it in hand and you, you pass your pencil over the top and it's like a pencil sharpener, but it's designed as a plane. I, I don't know if you've seen that. Anybody? Seen the no. Maybe not. Well, I thought maybe Shrenik had gotten up to bring you one to show. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I could, I could, I was almost uh, just dark. I couldn't see myself there. <laughs> so Richard, if I can ask you about the, the block plane that you showed that looked to be about only eight inches long, it uh, was the wooden block. And you said that that was also, yes, you said that's also a strike block plane. And it looks a lot like several planes that I have that I had never heard the term strike block plane before. So my question is, is how do you distinguish a strike block plane from a normal block plane? Um, is it the angle, the pitch of the uh, angle of the iron, or is it the length? And because in that Moxon description, it seemed to show that the, the the iron was midway in the plane as opposed to the number four, which was more forward. Um, so 
what distinguishes that to call it a strike block compared to just a average block? Right. Um, well, um, in England, um, I know in the States, you have uh, mitre planes that are just single iron uh, bevel down anyway that are pitched slightly lower. You just, they're described as mitre planes, aren't they? In England, we never get anything like that. Uh, so if one of the distinction in England for a, a strike block is one, it's got parallel sides. It won't be uh, like coffin shaped. Um, and it is the pitch of the iron generally. It's, it's lower than 45 degrees. So apart, and, and the fact that it's got no total or anything like that, it is just a square block. That's that in my mind is just what describes an English strike block plane is the parallel sides and a lower angle than normal. That was really it. And can it be a, a regular cut or a skew cut? Either way. Um, they're nearly always a regular cut. The, the one I showed you is the only skewed strike block I've ever seen, to be honest. Uh, um, I've never seen another one, so um, that's a bit of an anomaly for me. They're nearly always, well, they, all, the, all the ones I've ever seen are just straight, straight cut, basically, yeah. Okay. Good. Mm. So, uh, Hans, you got a question there. I do. I do. I do. First, uh, a shout out to uh, Bill and Sarah. So, uh, I did receive my book, Sarah. Thank you so much. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently uh, purchased. Uh, uh, Jim actually helped me out. I purchased a uh, Airs uh, Spear Airs plane. Uh, they had the wrong blade in it, so I. I went to the master or my master and got a little bit of help and got a new blade set for it. But unfortunately that was wrong too. So I'm still reasoning out what to do to fix it. Um, but uh, Sarah had posted that she had the, uh, the little booklet and sure enough, my plane is in there. So that was really neat. But, um, and there's a saying, Richard, that uh, the smartest man is one that agrees with you. So I really appreciate you saying that miter planes are not frigging miter planes because I always thought that was just the stupidest thing in the world. It, it doesn't make any. It doesn't make any sense. There's no handhold. There's no way to use them easily as a miter plane, much like something with a hot dog or you know the low angle Lee Nielsen or even the Stanley is much more handily used to do uh, shooting operation. And the other thing I think is funny is that the blade's not skewed because we all know that it's gonna make it easier to cut egg grain if the blade's skewed, right? So why wouldn't the miter plane, regardless of its shape, form, and function, have a skewed blade? That, that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the real question I have is the, low angle uh the the beautiful plane you had actually had and i can't remember what the name for the for the tail on the blade is what you would use to knock a blade out um, uh, yeah yeah right it's not it's not uh uh bill what is it called now because we're not called it nib. A nib. Anymore, <laughs> <are> we? <laughs> called it into matheson and I, thought it a, I thought it had some fancy name i don't know I, <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> nib is pretty simple. I don't know. It's, We've um, only got one nib problem. <laughs> <laughs> so wh wh why, why have we changed from snack to nib? Snack, oh, thank you. Snack. <laughs> I saw it coming. <laughs> <laughs> but why does that plane, Richard, have that on there? Because you would just loosen the lever cap and pull it out, right? Um, yeah, I, t I totally agree, to be honest with you. I, I, even uh, I use a, a Norris panel plane a lot. Um, um, I, I never dream of sort of trying to tap the iron back. It, I, it's just something I tap it forward just by very slight degrees, get it set, and that's it. If I yeah. tap it too far, I just take the whole thing out and start again. Um, yep. So I've never quite understood snacks myself, but maybe I've not used something with a snack enough to work out whether it is possible to find adjust it with a snack. I'm not sure. Well, I've got, I've got one, 
and I've used it to get the blade back out because it, it it's a wooden woody. So you know yeah. you don't have a way to loosen you know s smack it down on its head and you loosen everything. But to get just a little bit of movement, you know you can use that. I guess um, your your question on chariot planes. I was thinking where I come from in Illinois, um, there was a buggy factory, and someone actually found some planes supposedly made by Henny Buggy Factory specifically for certain features in a door frame or what have you. Um, and that's what I would call a chariot plane. So that's what's in my head is, is almost, you know, the very, very tiny radius sole or concave sole to do something special on a very short, you know, piece of door molding or something to mate another piece with and that's that's the only thing that i could think of that they would be used for if if i'm making the chariot plane into what i would call a buggy buggy plane <clears throat> yes it, it looks like jim's gone to get one for you i bet he did i hope he ships I, it i i, I have i good. have actually this i i showed bill this and this is a chariot plane yeah. that I, w I absolutely adore. I actually use it uh, as a block plane. Um, it was, um, I had 20 pence left in a boot fare <laughs> and it was in the bottom of a box. And if you look at the, if you look at the, um, can you see the bridge? It's got yeah. little places where you put your finger. That's and neat. it is so, and your, your iron, is in your heel in your palm of your hand so i said to the guy i've only got 20p left and i'm going home and he said oh i'll have 20p that'll be fine mate so i'll give you two pounds for it right now <laughs> <laughs> so not only is it this is called isaac because it's got a an isaac greaves iron on it i can't find the camera on this thing here it is <laughs> and it's um it's absolutely beautiful but um yeah, other than that, my the other chariot planes that I've had are, and this is a casting as well, but uh, anybody that's tried to work the inside of a casting, a raw casting, to try to fit anything into it uh, needs to be sectioned. I mean, I, I've done yeah. one. Actually, no, I've done two now because I did one for Peter, but it was, um, it was an utter nightmare. Yeah. And, um, and the, you know, really and truly, it's because it's a casting you're you're at the mercy of the mouth and if you don't get it right first time i mean you're trying to you're trying to refine the casting to get the mouth and i think they've succeeded quite well here and it, in fact it does um it does cut beautifully i mean it's it's almost as good as uh, as a mitre plane but it's i think these that is that is 100 the exception yeah and it is an extremely low angle as well <laughs> and it's bevel up as well inside so um i have no idea what the i've tried to take i took the front knob off uh, the front screw out and nothing adjusts but i thought at first it was actually a mouth adjuster on it but it's not so chariot planes in general i totally agree with richard but um that one is an exception hmm. that, that looked like it had a, a cupid bow in there as well it does it, it does it in in the mouth well, one for Bill there. Is that clear? Yeah, this mm -hmm. is a particularly beautiful Cupid's bow. As I say, it's got two little finger holds on it. Let me see if I can. Yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And it's got two beautiful little finger holds in it. If I catch the light, so that when you put your hand over the top, it it fits in one or other, it, depending on whether you're left-handed or right-handed. You see. <laughs> so, uh, Jim, this is a, br a bronze casting here. Um, and it, it's, it doesn't have the luxury of a of a, a cupid's bow, but it has your your um your, your fingerprint here that you can press down and go. So it's, it's 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 quite it's chunky, it's fat, it's heavy, but it, it does work. It's a good it's a good tool. Uh, actually, funny enough, I noticed that, and that's very very wide. Now, funny today, Ted, who I know is on, but um, is muted and and also doesn't like him, you know because he's an A list celebrity, he doesn't like coming on as a uh, with a video. But um, Ted, Ted showed me a picture of one that's up for sale on eBay at the moment, I, I believe. And um, it is two and three eighths inch 
wide um, itself. And um, the I was looking for one because I'd never seen a chariot plane that was basically as wider than it. It's almost as wide. It, I think it's five inches long, just over five inches long, and two and a two and three eighth wide, nearly um, two and a half wide. And I was looking through all the catalogues and. Richard gave me Lambert's Spears catalog for my birthday. Thank you, Richard. And I was reading that in the sunshine this morning with a bit of Blue Mountain. And um, in the back is a chariot plane in the catalog. And I think it's the catalog from 1909. And it may be the one that you've got there, Hank. Um, it's um, at the back of the catalog. Um, it's, 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 and it's got two handles on the side that presumably come off. And it's called a sad. It's called a Cooper's. It's used for cooping, uh, for a Cooper's plane, um, and uh, I presume it's used in some way in barrel making. I well, see it there. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, this, this one, this one here measures um, just under five inches by um, two inches. Yeah, it's wider than that. It's wider by another half feet, which when in width is quite a bit. And I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that's a small plane, but it, it, it's incredibly heavy. Incredibly heavy. Yeah, this Chester, weighs in, what, I think, 1.3 kilograms. I'm Chester, what were you holding up there? Well, it's the back of the uh, catalog, the spear catalog, and that's, this, that's the chariot plane that's on the back page of the Spears catalog that I got from Sarah and Bill. And um, it says that the three sizes that were offered are one, one and an eighth and one and a quarter inch widths. Um, and all of the lengths are the same, which is three and three quarter inches long. Yeah, this, I think it's a different catalog to the small one. Um, and it's got the chariot plane as well. I haven't got it down here with me. I, I took it back up to the house, but um, if you look in the Lambert book, it's 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 in the in the I think I think it's 1909 catalogue, and uh, it is definitely designated. And there's a some there's another name for it, which is really weird, like a plucker or something like that. I'll, I'll yeah, be rude, it's but it, it's not in this book. But oddly, while the covers are similar, the interior is different because the back of this book is blank. And there's a sundries. Um, I don't know if you can. Uh, just a whole bunch of things that you can buy to, as add-ons, blades, etc. <laughs> yeah. But the chariot plane is it's uh, page uh, fourteen and fifteen. So it's it's still there. It's just different location. It's a different different printing from what Chester has. Because I mean, they, they a lot of the chariot planes. I have, I have another uh, casting. So, what while Jim's getting the other casting, uh, Rusty, you've got a question. I wanted to go back to the bevel up, bevel down. And one of the things I thought the bevel up planes could be a little bit more um, versatile is that you can adjust the pitch of the cutting, the cutting angle by changing the, the bevel on the iron. So I, I have a Veritas bevel up plane that I have a 25 degree iron and a 55 degree iron. And they're better at 25 degrees. So you don't have to put a new frog on, you can just put a new iron on. And it works almost like a scraper with a very, very steep um, pitch. But I don't think it was, I think it's pretty modern invention. I don't know that that's how they were used back in the 19th century. D Richard, do you know if people use different angle irons with the bevel up planes? I, no, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I'm very, I don't know how to put it. Um, when it comes to sharpening angles um, in the workshop, everything I use, chisels, plain irons, everything. I don't, I don't differ from anything. Everything is 30 degrees. Everything I use is 30 degrees. Um, because that's, I don't know, I just stick to that one thing. And I've found that when I've used chisels and planes, if, if I go drop below 30 degrees, 
um, they go blunt pretty quick. If I go above 30 degrees, they seem bloody hard to push. And 30 degrees to me is the sweet spot. So I never really play around with it. Everything you pick up in my, if you came to my workshop, everything in the workshop that I own is ground at 30 degrees and that's it. <laughs> Bother with anything else. But, with the 30 um, degrees, so I've never gone down that road. <laughs> with the 30 degrees, do you uh, add a secondary bevel or you just sharpen to 30 degrees? Oh, we're getting into dangerous territory now. Um, <laughs> oh, no. I, I think this is a whole, whole bench yep. talk all about angles. <laughs> <laughs> have you noticed there's a common denominator here about nibs and sharpening and all of the things that we never ever talk about and they're coming from the same source have you not yep. noticed i think you should ban, i think you should ban him what do you reckon jeffrey well you know, i just want to remind people i did not bring sharpening up at all <laughs> I, jim it's i do have my fault. the power to mute i do have the power to mute <laughs> Um, the answer to your question, I never use a secondary bevel, no. Um, I sort of do, but not really. Derek, Jeffrey. over to you. Jeffrey, evening everybody. Um, I just wanted to take us back a few steps to uh, Joseph Moxon. It's, it's worth remembering when you read Moxon and some of those old books that some, Moxon, although he was a, an, an incredibly talented map maker, mathematician, I'm not aware that he was actually a jobbing, working carpenter, cabinet maker, furniture maker, call it what you like. So he's, we have to take some of his um, comments with a pinch of salt because... Was, it, was he a dodgy editor? Is that, is that what you're saying there? I, I, th I think he had a dodgy editor. I, I think he was just a writer, you know. He's, yeah. I mean, no, but I, 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 think, I mean, that happens an awful lot. Them, you know. That that happens that happens an awful lot with old old texts that um, you have to take some of that dialogue with a pinch of salt, because unless they're actually written by people using the tools that are on the tools, it really is just um, sort of secondhand information, and that happens an awful lot in Moxon and some of the older texts as well. No. Oh, no. I would second that. Second that. Yeah. Sorry, Richard, I stepped on you. No, it's okay. Yeah. I think no, one of no, the and Tenon just made that comment, Derek, that right. um, if you go back, say 1500, 1700 even, oh, the... your training is passed down, apprenticeship, etc. You didn't have any of this written down. You just no. learned it. Oh. And so then when there were experts at writing, they would go around and gather the information and write it up and sell a book, but they weren't necessarily teaching. You know, you had to fast forward a little bit further before you really had teachers teaching out of manuals or even the, a non-apprenticeship type situation, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, Morty's Antenna, is, is that a magazine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one that's doing a bit, little bit better than the furniture and cabinet making, I think, at the moment. There you go. <laughs> which, which one was that? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I it went, um, I, I think it, it started to go downhill about a year ago. Whilst, whilst we've, got, we've got Bill, Bill, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, it's, good, it's good to see you and Sarah here. Oh. Um, you know, it's great that you, you post so much on YouTube, you post so much on the Instagram. It, it's absolutely a, a brilliant stuff. And, and you know, we, we learn so much from it. And, and what you produce from, from your shed is, is just amazing. You know, well, I've got, you got, got, got a couple here of, of your... Can you, can you hear um, And, and uh, you, you know, this one here, and I think this is why we're, we're doing this. I think you need to just point out this one here. This is uh, your right. miniature shooting. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not very good with the camera angle. Uh, yeah. But um, this was actually one of the lots of last year's auction. And I think we just need to bring back the auction here now, because um, actually the, the, the plane that uh, Richard has just been showing is um, about the auction. Uh, well, it's not the auction anymore, it's about a draw. So R Richard, could you just remind everybody about the charity uh, and about the prizes that you've got, um, you know, that, that's going on the, the 6th of June. Yeah, yeah, good point, Jeffrey. Um, yeah, I mean, um, 
last week, obviously, Jim talked about his um, stair saw, which is uh, one of the three tools that are going to be on offer uh, in this prize draw. Um, the second item, can you all see what I'm holding up there? I should have put this up before. Um, this is uh, a miniature mitre plane, a beautiful one in uh, bronze and uh, boxwood that Bill has kindly donated. And obviously the strike block is the third item that will be up in the auction. Um, all the money that's um, being raised in this is going to Macmillan Cancer Nurses, uh, who uh, really need our support at the moment because, um, I mean, they always need the money. But at the moment, um, obviously, with what's going on in the world, it's even more important that we keep giving them funds uh, at the moment. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's... It, anybody that donates on the just giving page uh, their name will go in a hat and uh, on the 6th of june um three of those names will be drawn out and um each one will win one of these three items and there's some uh, runner-up prizes as well isn't the jim is it five tins of alfie shine yeah, yeah that's that's correct yeah with the yeah. five five runners up get yeah. uh Get five tins of the famous Alfie shine signed by Alfie. He'll put his yeah. paw prints on them. <laughs> there, there is actually as well, Richard, an update today, which I briefly covered with you. Um, and that was, um, I suppose you could almost say it's an extra extra prize. But with the, um, with the um, uh, staircase saw, which is almost finished, um, it is now sporting a skeleton saws um, blade because we tested the um, the Drabble and Sanderson one which Richard kindly gave me and it was too aggressive and um, I was quite disappointed and um, I thought well this isn't good enough um, and there's nothing we could do about it so I, on Tuesday I quickly phoned Shane Skelton up mm -hmm. and said to him mate I really am in the dog's doo doos here and um, I explained to him what the problem was. And we talked for about an hour on um, the geometry of what should be in a staircase saw, even though he'd not actually seen one. Um, we described the, the fact that it was going across the face of a piece of wood and so on and so forth. Um, so he came up with the, with the geometry uh, of this plate, uh, which is now, um, he, he actually made it on Tuesday just after I put the phone down to him and it arrived at 10 o'clock this morning. So um, I think we owe him a huge uh, debt of gratitude Absolutely. for rescuing us there from, <laughs> from a certain death. Absolutely. And uh, also it, it turns um, an, amateur, an amateur tool into a professional piece of kit because the, 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 the working end is um, probably the, one of the best saw makers, it will not probably the most, the best saw maker in the world. So this is now, um nine ppi um instead of the three <laughs> three or four that it was and um <laughs> it, and it's also got a 12 degree rake because he said there's no way a vertical um zero rake would work um and so i i don't know why it doesn't work um i did try ted's one ted um and it didn't work and i i i've no idea whether they were more butch in those days um and got it to work but um uh, or they were working on some weird wood, but it just skipped across the surface when I tried to use it. This one, um, it just says hello wood and takes it out. So 100%, um, 1000% better. So it's, uh, it's one of the prizes, as Richard mentioned, in the prize draw, which we're getting for donations now. Um, we're up to, I think, Richard, we're up to nearly 4,000, 3,777. Um, quite a lot today. So um, we've got ways to go to 7,000, but I think with that additional plate, uh, it turns it into a masterpiece. So um, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for that uh, little bit extra there. And uh, Richard, thank you very much for doing your talk on, on, the, uh, on, on the strike plate. Um, very, right. very informative. So what, what we're going to do, I'm going to just do a quick summary now, um, and then we'll stop the recording. <coughs>
um, and then we, we can uh, we, we can carry on if we want. So some people last week carried on for an hour or something. But uh, what we'll do is, um, uh, you know, it's it's really good that uh, you know you've you've given the time, Richard, and you've given us that really good talk on, on the strike block plane. And what's interesting again, like last week, is the differences across the world. Um, listening to how different people use it, how different people, you know, um, call the terminology of the different parts. So really, really good. Um, so I do encourage you all to, uh, to purchase a ticket, um, you know, go across to the Just Given. I will put a link on there so that you can support Richard and Jim um, with, the, with the charity. Um, and, and, and Bill. And, and, and Bill, sorry, Bill as well. Um, well, I am actually hoping that uh, maybe we could tempt Bill into having a little discussion next week about Bill and what Bill does with his planes. <laughs> you must be joking. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll I'm, no good. <laughs> I'm no good at expressing myself. No. Oh, I don't know about that, Bill. No, I, can't. I think with some coaching from Jim and from Richard, I think you will do incredibly well. 